segment three. Let's go through your, the background of your life here in fighting this fight that you've just described. Righteous indignation. I intentionally co-created, this is a little tricky problem uh -huh. here for you, Andrew. I intentionally co-created the Huffington Post. I, Andrew Breitbart, intentionally co-created the Huffington Post in order to grant the hard left a place in the blogosphere to express itself. Okay, explain yourself. Uh, I had been Ariana Huffington's researcher up until the point where she converted on a dime. One day we're... You knew Ariana when she was still conservative. Oh, absolutely. She right. dug up Larry Lawrence from Arlington National Cemetery. Thank you, Explain Ariana. Larry Lawrence. Larry Lawrence was an uh, ambassador. Clint, uh, ambassador from Switzerland, Clinton's number one donor, and he granted him a waiver to be in Arlington National Cemetery. He had never even been in the Merchant Marines. Right. So she had her credentials. She got that scandal. That's right. And I enjoyed being with her when she was a conservative, but I walked out the door when she switched to the left. She right. came to me five years later, five years of awkward air kissing at parties that we would run into each other. Uh, she came to me after the 2004 election cycle and said, do you have any ideas for a website? And she had a money guy and we came up with the plan and it was to create this place where if we could get your friends who you couldn't afford to write for you, to write for you for free, it would be exceptionally helpful to you. You'll be the queen of the left-wing blogosphere. I said, but from my standpoint, right now, if you want to hear what the actual left has to say, not Katie Kirk pretending to be neutral, what the left has to say, all there is on the Internet in 2004 is the Daily Kos, where a Peter Robinson could write an op-ed, uh, Bush is e the equivalent to Hitler, under a pseudonym, 2 Live Crew 333378. And that constituted a transparency mm -hmm. within the media where, well, an opaqueness where these people could write these things. And, and, and Koss himself was being put on Meet the Press. So, and so I said, Ariana, you can become the online, the salon that you have at your house, you can put online. And it worked. It, but the idea was, and I said this to, any number of brand name people that I have in my life from the radio, this is, this is going to be crazy because I've gone to Young America's Foundation, you know, uh, events and I've talked to these kids and they know me to be the real deal. I mean what I say and I say what I mean and I'm conservative, but I think this is going to be helpful for conservatives because it will okay. be source material. Um, and the first day that it launched, and I was worried about it being Huffington the Post. Huffington Post right, launched. Right, right. I was driving up Lincoln Boulevard, worried because I was getting emails from people saying, how could you do this? And I listened to Michael Medved uh, on the first day that it launched, reading aloud Rob Reiner's first day post, where are the Woodwards and Bernsteins of today to take on uh, George Bush? And he was howling and I was howling in the car, and I was tearing up, uh, just thinking this guy, this guy, this meathead guy who wants to add a pat, you know, a dollar, you know, to every cigarette pack to pay for right, lettuce right. patches or something. This incoherent guy proved my point, and and within six, I left within a month, and I remember one point. This is my favorite moment mm -hmm. during Katrina. Mm -hmm. Randall Robinson at the Huffington Post wrote an article two days into the flooding that black people were cannibalizing each other in New Orleans. And, and Drudge put it up, uh, a link at the Drudge Report, and within 24 hours, Ariana called me up and she said, you won. I said, what do you mean you won? She goes, we retracted the story. So I wa this, was, this was, I swear, yeah, I'm a mischievous guy. I, I, to a great extent, I was more inspired. Okay, Andrew, 20 years or whatever it's been, 15 years later, who's winning in the internet? You've got Ariana just sold the Huffington Post. She's continuing to operate it from AOL, moveon.org, daily, Co these are still big. Yeah. You've got your enormous number, your number, so who's winning? Well, I think that it, uh, I, 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 look, conservative look, and libertarian has no, been what you I, hoped. I, I think, look, the media is still left of center, and they're trying to buffer up their waning enterprise, their waning uh, monopoly, by giving three hundred and fifteen million dollars to Ariana Huffington. Is AOL coming to me saying, "Wow, you've got this audience of of the, of the center right"? It wouldn't dawn on them because it is the war that I've described. Who's winning? Well, 
monetarily, they still are controlling the majority of the pieces. But so there's still something second class, second rate oh, about the course, conservative. Of course, but yeah. what we are winning tactically, because you know Hannah, James, Hannah Giles and James O'Keefe took down Acorn uh, with a, a high quality ta uh, video series uh, that cost less than $1,400, which sends a message to the average kid out there that if ABC, CBS, and NBC are not going to cover things and, and act as a checks and balance against progressive organizations, against the AFL-CIO, against the uh, SEIU, ACORN, other community organizing groups, then we can do it ourselves. And we're having an effect going around the main, the Democrat media complex over it or right straight forward. And my business model is to aim every one of our exposés straight at the mainstream media and say, Katie Crook, uh, you are being dared not to cover this. All right. Segment four, the theory of which you have more in this book than I'd expected. Righteous indignation. A lot gets explained here. Marx and Hegel had paved the way for the progressives who in turn had paved the way for the Frankfurt School who had then attacked the American way of life by pushing cultural Marxism through critical theory. There's a lot going on there. Very briefly, what's the Frankfurt School and why should anyone watching this interview care? Okay, first of all, anyone that reads this book is going to get, is going to laugh and they're going to cry and they're going to get Andrew in all of his zany different multi yes, multiple layers. But there's one chapter that is like putting the medicine in the sherbet in order to get your kid to take it, in order to get rid of his, his, his fever. And to me, my one discovery, my one great epiphany, my one aha moment that I said, I, I got it, I got it, I see what exactly happened with, with in this country. The Frankfurt School were emigres from... Uh, uh, Germany, well, Austria. Well, well Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 there was a, it was the equivalent of this, the Hoover Institution. What, the Hoover Institution is to Stanford University. The Frankfurt uh, School was a think tank at, at the University of Frankfurt, and they were social scientists uh, like Herbert Marcuse, Antonio Gramsci, uh, Horkheimer, Adorno. These were all a bunch of guys mm -hmm. in, in the middle of World War II who had suffered Europe in Europe, you know, two world wars in a row, and they had been fighting. They, you had know, they had been fighting the Nazis, and they were trying to figure out another aspect of how to uh, affect, how, how to spread Marxism around the world. You could go to Bolivia, you could go to Bulgaria, and you could go to the peasant class, and you could say, let's, let's flip this place. The Marxist Stallman argument of getting the workers to get uh, upset at the owners uh, was very easy, but not in America where the middle class was invested in, in their, their productivity, invested in the concept that they could have their own small little American dream, a white picket fence, that they could invent mm -hmm. something and go from one generation be, to being dirt poor to being an owner within a very quick period of time. And what these guys figured out when they came to the United States, and Adorno is the one that drives me the most crazy, I, he came out to California um, and I think it was Bertolt Brecht, the, 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 uh, East, German the, the East German playwright, moved to Santa Monica in the 1940s at the height of the Golden Age. Think about this. These guys left. These guys left Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy to come to California in the 1940s, and they lived by the beach, and they were depressed by the relentless cheeriness, the productivity, and the capitalism that they witnessed around them. And they came up with a, a they came up with at the end of the day, we could call it uh, cultural Marxism, but at the end of the day, we experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. And by that, I mean a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. Uh, it's political correctness and it's multiculturalism. And what it took was this amazing concept of e pluribus unum, where everybody comes here and contributes to this, this, you know, everybody becomes an American and contributes, but we have a common culture, we have a common border, a common mindset. What they did was take the haves versus have-nots friction mm -hmm. and translated it into uh, oppressor versus the oppressed. And, it, and, it, and this it, got taken up by faculties across the country. That's, 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 that's the that, point of the Frankfurt School and yes, the Frankfurt progressivism. They it becomes embraced they, by 60s post-structuralism. Academics. Post-structuralism. Queer studies, uh, uh, African-American studies, 
all that all of that is pitting people against each other it is anti american to its core if marcuse was the I'm quoting again from righteous indignation if marcuse was the jesus of the new left then Saul Alinsky was his St. Paul. Again, let me just put it to you in simple terms. Who's Saul Alinsky, and why should anyone watching this interview care? Well, Hillary Clinton wrote her senior thesis on Saul Alinsky at Wellesley. Uh, we, uh, Barack Obama is an acolyte of Saul Alinsky. He created the concept of community organizing, and what he did, as I argue in this book, is he took all of this ethereal claptrap, this Noam Chomsky-like jargon that the average person couldn't understand. Herbert Marcuse is very hard to read. Right. It's all, it's, it's, all all impo hard. it's all impossible <laughs> all right. to read. Uh, but he was able to translate this cultural Marxist down to a series of rules and a mindset, a warrior mindset, where the critical theory was like, take on your enemy, take him directly on destroy that person. He applied critical theory down to the street war level and I would argue that the Katie Couric's of the world, uh, the Chris Matthews of the world, uh, Rachel Maddow and Keith Olbermann, unbeknownst even to themselves, are studied in the tactics of Alinsky. Segment five. <clears throat> the Breitbart pragmatic primer for realistic revolutionaries. Righteous indignation. My transformation from empty-headed, hard to believe you are ever empty-headed, but we'll let you get away with that. My transformation from empty-headed, pop culture-infused, talking points parroting liberal to new media warrior took me four decades. But those years in the wilderness taught me some basic rules that I've applied steadily and steadfastly and that are bearing tremendous results, close quote. So you then present your own rules to answer Saul Alinsky's rules. Don't be afraid to go into enemy territory. What do you mean by that? I can't tell you how many people tell me, don't go on to the Bill Maher show. Uh, um, take it right to them. Oh, it's the best. I, or, And first of all, I've had my greatest successes because I live in West Los Angeles. A, my life is taking it to them. I live in West Los Angeles. I live amid you know, the Hollywood rubble. <laughs> and when I do a Bill Maher show, and I go to Starbucks the next morning, and the barista says, I saw you on TV last night, and I didn't like how the audience was booing you before you finished your sentences. And I thought that you made an interesting point. Nobody, nobody sought me out to reclaim me on behalf of my parents, not even my parents. I tripped upon conservatism. Mm. My goal is mm. to go out there and find someone else like me who'd never even known what conservatism was and say, hey, you know, maybe I can draw you in. I try and do it through mirth and humor a lot of the times and in addition to uh, the, the investiga investigative stuff that I do. I mean, when I say confront these people head on, I mean, I went down to the anti-coke rally on rollerblades and a camera to get them to... That was you know, your stuff? That was your film? Well, well so, though Christian Hartsock was there and I was there and we both captured unbelievable you know, pro-violence rhetoric. Uh, let's right. let's string up uh, Clarence Thomas, what these progressives had to say. Just terrible, terrible stuff. Be open about your secrets. Be open about your secrets. That's one of your rules. What do you mean? Uh, they're going to, you know, I, I talk about how I, I drank a lot in college. It's not a huge revelation. I don't think I drank more than the average person that was in New Orleans at, at the time. But I always wake up at night thinking that the Alinskyites, mm. you know, the, the Sid Blumenthal's of the world, uh, the Fenton Communications of the world, the Media Matters of the world, the John Podesta's of the world are going to find what your Achilles heel is and they're going to exploit it. And so why not throw it out there? Barack Obama did exactly that when he wrote in one of his books uh, that he, he used co with that he experimented with drugs. You have to do that because they're going to find it. If you own it and you talk about what you learned from that experience or you show that you're human and not try to pretend to be a perfect public you know, entity, I think that you're going to be, you're, you're going to fare a, a zillion.